Please always consult with your physicians prior to making any changes to your treatment plan. Welcome to Living with Scanxiety, the cancer podcast, a podcast geared to help you navigate the pediatric cancer world. As a mother of a child who battled a soft tissue sarcoma for over a year, your host, Rosaria Kozar, understands and will help guide you through your journey. She brings the knowledge of experts, families, survivors, and other organizations tied to the pediatric cancer world to your doorstep. Her mission is to inform, support, and promote hope for you and your family. I feel like my life's mission is to use my God-given gifts to help other people find their inner strength to overcome whatever adversity they've faced so that they can believe in themselves and find their inner resilience to live a life more meaningful and filled with purpose and joy. Hi, this is Rosaria and I'm with Adriana Lewin, who has a child that battled cancer. We're going to hear about that in a little while. She also is a licensed counselor. In the South, you'll find out where exactly. I'm so excited to have her here today to share her story and some information about what she does and who she is and how she can help you. So welcome, Adriana, to the show. Thank you so much, Rosaria. I'm so excited to be here. I know we've been trying to get together and talk about this for a while. So it's, it's an honor for me to be a guest on your amazing podcast. Well, it's an honor to have you here. Seriously. We have, um, been chit chatting back and forth and finally got you here. So I'm just, I, I'm elated that you were able to come on. So I have to start by asking, where do you want to start? Because there's so much information that we wanted to cover. Yeah. So, you know, it's funny. Um, I think as my name is Adriana Lewin, um, and basically (laughs) to summarize it without being my identity, I am a licensed professional counselor. I live in the state of Texas. Um, and I have a child who is surviving from rhabdomyosarcoma. Uh, he was diagnosed literally the hours going into Thanksgiving in 2019. Uh, and we started treatment in December of 2019. He did chemo and radiation for about almost a year. And, um, so 2020, when the pandemic hit, we were in the middle of all that and it was kind of a scary time. Um, and he basically finished October, 2020, and we've been, adjusting to life since then. And basically uh, one of the main reasons why you probably brought me on here, um, not only because we're friends, no, I'm just kidding, but, um, because there is, um, basically during my son's treatment, I started, I guess you could call it like a ministry. I started family chemotherapy and the goal and the vision that I had in mind back then was to be able to help people find resources that pertain to your mental health as a caregiver going through childhood cancer. And then, you know, from a therapist's mindset, because I was already a therapist during my son's diagnosis and treatment, started realizing, okay, well, there's not really a whole lot of information surrounding how to talk about cancer with your kids and how to, you know, interact in your family, because the dynamic changes so much when you have one child diagnosed with cancer, it just, it changes everything in the household. And so dealing with that and just the struggles of being a parent and for us personally, it was being a parent to multiple kids, um, one having cancer, but it's still, you know, my other kids still needed me because they were also pretty young. And so trying to find resources for that was really difficult. And so the goal has been, um, to provide resources. I did start a podcast. Um, I have not done much with it in a while. And part of that was, I did need a mental health break from everything childhood cancer, because it's a lot, you know, it changes the way that your brain is wired and it, I needed that to 
allow myself some time to grieve and to readjust and recalibrate my brain so that I wasn't always functioning in the state of crisis almost. So uh, family chemotherapy has continued to evolve. Um, after I took a, a pretty good long break, it's, I came back and I was like, okay, I know this is going to continue moving in that direction. And I learned how to do it on a balanced um, flow so that I keep my mental health in check because that is like the most important thing now is <laughs> keeping my mental health in check and keeping my sanity. So yeah, so that's a little bit about me. Um, I do say y'all, so I'm going to apologize in advance because I'm a big y'all person having been born and raised in Texas. So that's, that's me in a nutshell. The fact that you went right out of that into uh, helping others. I mean, that's really remarkable. I, it took me five years. So for you to just kind of come out and go into the world of cancer and continue that, but it's also really great that you um, recognize that you needed that mental health break. So family chemotherapy guys, you should definitely check it out. It has a super cool logo too. Every single letter is pertaining to something, uh, childhood cancer, like, so, um, it's like the, what can you explain? Like, yeah. One yeah, of them so, or two of them? yeah. Oh, <laughs> I, love it. I can explain. If you look at the logo, the logo actually, it starts with the, we called it the buddy um, because the hospital that we started at called the IV pole, right? That let them kind of roam around some that they were connected to. They called it the buddy. And so we, uh, the T in therapy is basically that with some, uh, a bow list or two, right? So, uh, and then the rest of it is basically, band-aids and tubes and a stethoscope and just, um, stuff that my kid literally used in the middle of treatment. I had this like whole stash of stuff and I just threw together, made it look like a word therapy. So, you know, the artsy fartsy in me. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you see that logo guys, that is Adriana's podcast and you should definitely check it out. It's great. But she also has something on her plate where I'd love for you to talk about this because I participated in one of these group sessions and found it so therapeutic and it's so easy. There's like an, I'm just so super excited for her to talk about it. So do you want to yeah, thank you? Take yes. Me yes. Lead? <laughs> yeah. I'll dive in on that. So, uh, there is a community platform. Yeah, there is a Facebook page, but I found that there is, uh, it's just easier to kind of compartmentalize everything into one platform when possible. And so, um, if you go to community.familychemotherapy.com, it will allow you to sign up for the community. And what's in the community is what I'm, I've been working on. This has been like my baby and I'm super excited for where it's been, where it is and where it's going. And right now, so one of the groups that Rosaria is talking about, um, we did a virtual meeting basically online, just a, it's called like a social, social night out essentially is what it is. And that's something that we've been doing here in the Dallas Metroplex area. We just get together about once a month in person, but because it's freezing cold right now and the pandemic was pretty bad, we decided to do it virtually. Um, and that was, it was really good. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it's getting to meet other parents who have been through childhood cancer or who are still in the midst of it. And they just want to feel seen and validated and hear other people's stories, no matter, you know, where they're at. And so it's just a really great way to connect with other parents because online, I love Facebook. Don't get me wrong. I'm like, I was, I've been in Facebook since Facebook was for college students only. So that, me too. That, that, that so tells old. you how old I am. <laughs> so it's like, oh, I'm a diehard fan for Facebook. You know, it's like, I will stick around with them. I'm a lifer probably. But um, I just, there's something about Facebook that is so impersonal sometimes. It's like you are on these like chat boards essentially, but you want to have someone actually hear you, see you, and you just want to feel 
validated and seen. Right. And so getting onto these like video conferences or going into the, um, when we do like these little activities where we just get together to have dinner, it's not like fancy stuff, you know, go into a game. It's literally sit down, let's get to know each other. Let's just talk. Um, it doesn't have to be about cancer. It's just let it be organic and go as it goes. So we do these and we will be doing them virtually, uh, for a while. So that's the exciting thing on there. Um, I have done, I'm starting my second book club and that launches this weekend the get to get, uh, get to know each other. And then on the following week. So I want to say that is, uh, the first weekend in February, we will be diving into the body keeps a score by Bessel van der Kolk, which is going to be all, you know, basically let's talk about a book that talks about trauma and it's not necessarily talking about cancer, but we can take it and see how it applies to our life and see how we can take what we learn and change our perspective and maybe find some healing or find a direction to where to find healing. So, uh, I've done a book. The first book study we did was on man's search for meaning. And it was just so powerful. It was just incredibly powerful to all of us come together and share our stories and just to see how we could, you know, relate to people's suffering and it wasn't even about cancer. So, um, so yeah, we got the book study, we've got the, uh, social gatherings and even though like, yes, I'm a licensed professional counselor. These are not, um, I'm drawing a blank here. They're not group therapy. Uh, it's not group therapy. So I'm not stepping in there as a therapist. I'm stepping in there as a fellow mother who had a kid with cancer. So it's more like of a a support group. Um, and it's conversational organic because I'm one of you guys too. I've been there. I'm still working through the trauma. You know, um, it's not like I've reached this place where I'm like completely healed because I feel like every once in a while something pops up and you're like, Whoop, I need a minute. I need a minute to process this. Mm-hmm. So, um, there's a lot of other little things in there that I'm really excited about. Um, but those, I would say would probably be the, the two I can think of the top of my head right now. Absolutely. And the way that it's designed the platform, you can post things and people can comment on them. And I really like that feature. You kind of have a profile that you can set up with a picture. Uh, And like you said, there are fellow moms. Are you going to have dads in there or just moms? Oh yeah. It's for both parents. I think there's something, you know, as the therapist brain in me, there's something so invaluable about men hearing the women's struggle and the women hearing men's struggle, like seeing that even if it's not your husband telling his story, he could, you know, you might hear someone comment about how they processed their child's trauma. And I just find that for some people, they need to hear a man's side of the the coin, you know? So yeah. So it's for both. Uh, eventually it will be more open for the goal is to have siblings and other people join. Um, but for the, for the moment, as we continue to build it out, it's only going to be available to the caregiver. That's fantastic. This is an awesome idea. I can see where you're headed with this and your excitement on your face and, Uh, When I was in one of those, uh, I hate calling them sessions because like you said, they're not therapy. I don't know. Circles of trust. (laughs) Yeah. The circle of trust. I feel like we're quoting them to be (laughs) here. I know. Right. So that's right. That's yeah. Ben Stiller. What's the movie? Yeah. I can't remember the name of it, but it was a good one. Um, Robert De Niro was circle of yes, yes yes oh my gosh I can't remember the name of that movie but that was like one of my favorite movies <laughs> the yeah circle of trust the circle you have to be inside the circle yeah um so I just I feel like it's this 
kind of like unity and the fact that you're having it even including people outside of Texas and it is uh, virtual. It's just, it's great. It's a new step in the right direction for parents and caregivers that have something um, that's concerning to them and they want to bring to other people and they want to con- be consoled or get advice yeah. or just just be there to listen. So thank you so yeah. much for doing that for the community. I really appreciate it. It is, you know, my passion project. I am just, I'm just very passionate about it. I just know that this is something that the community has been needing. And especially during the times of the pandemic, because, you know, when we were in the middle of our treatment, we didn't really get to know other parents and some people don't want to get to know other parents and that's fine. You know, they kind of want to have their tunnel vision blinders on because it's a, it's a lot being in our community can be a lot for some parents when they're still trying to grapple with the idea of their child having to battle through cancer. Absolutely. Um, but for those who are ready, you know, to, to integrate with other people and to just find a connection with someone that gets it because, you know, you hear time and time again, parents talking about, I have a hard time connecting with my friends because they're, you know, their struggles are nothing compared to what I feel like I'm struggling with. And it's hard to feel like you can connect with them anymore. And so sometimes getting together with someone who already knows the backstory and understands your struggle, it can be, it allows you to have conversation outside of childhood cancer. You know, you already feel like you've been seen and heard and validated. So you're allowed to be a little bit more yourself. Or if you need to talk about those things, you know, that that parent is going to be like, well, everything's going to be fine. Just keep praying. Everything will be fine. You'll see, you know? And so just knowing that these parents aren't going to really just dismiss my fears. They're going to be like, yeah, that sucks. (laughs) I totally get that. Like, let me tell you how it was for, for our family and what worked, what didn't work. Give it a go. You know, I agree 110%. It's, it's hard. And that sense of community is there. And like you said, you don't have to talk about cancer if you don't want to. So, um, anything else you want to add? Yeah, actually. Um, one of the things that I, when I started, when I actually started family chemotherapy, I started it as a podcast and, when I went and started doing the podcast and doing my notes, I was like, Oh, well I like to write. So I might as well just like put these out there as a blog. So essentially it's a blog and a podcast and the blog itself. Um, the goal is to have, you know, enough information out there that if a parent wants to read a relatable story, great. Other parents can contribute and send in and submit their, uh, writing if they want to be in the blog as a guest blogger. And, um, if not, you know, we also have other therapists who do write about things pertaining to mental health and childhood cancer. So, um, the other thing that I'm actually really excited about is the, we're, I'm working on, um, a database that has a list of providers across the 50 States. I know, you know, for across the sea, I know you have a lot of listeners that are all over the world. Um, so I'm, I, I would love to connect with other people on the other side of the pond, as they like to say, you know, to see if there are providers who specialize in specifically the psychosocial for, uh, oncology, pediatric oncology specifically. Um, but for now I have started building that database, uh, across the 50 States, and it's, it's gained some traction. I can always continue to add more people because the goal is to provide that database, make it available for people who are looking for a therapist. Because one thing I, as, that I know as a therapist and what I've seen, what I've witnessed, experienced, you know, all of the above, you realize that not everybody wants to go to therapy as soon as their child is diagnosed. They kind of get into this state of crisis. and you know, luckily for me at some point we're driving home right after my son was diagnosed before he started treatment. And my husband was like, 
okay, what are you going to do to take care of yourself? And I looked at him like, what? Like, you know, like your brain is like foggy. Like, what are you talking about? Like everything feels just like slow motion. And I just still remember him asking me that. And I'm just so thankful that he remembered to remind me because even as a therapist doesn't mean that I don't have those natural reactions that everybody does, right? Like I need somebody too to hold me accountable and to encourage me and to make me step outside of my comfort zone sometimes to, to stay well myself. And so, um, because of that, you know, you start realizing not everybody's ready to go to therapy at the beginning and not everybody can make that commitment. They're afraid to make that commitment because you realize you don't know if your child is going to go neutropenic and you have to run and take your child to the hospital. And if you forget to call your therapist and your therapist isn't like very understanding and you might've been canceling on her for like the third or fourth time, you know, her graces might be, you know, limited, I guess you could say. And so it just makes it really complicated to go to a therapist. I get that at times. Um, And that, especially like pre pandemic, like when people weren't really so virtual as they are now, like, Ooh, that was, I mean, that's tough. You know, I started therapy a couple of months in for myself and I was very lucky that it was all virtual. So I never had to go in person. Um, but then there's also people who don't like, if they're not ready for therapy, people might be ready to read somebody else's story and find a connection or a a bit of inspiration or a sense of hope through somebody else's story. Because I do believe that the power of therapy isn't necessarily, yeah, like we have the ability to provide you with tools, but the power of therapy is connecting with another human being on a very deep and personal level where you feel seen in a way that no one has seen you. And that person doesn't, you know, you you know, your therapist isn't scared and you know that your therapist is going to support you and bring you out of like the funk when you, you go into that deep state of like depression or suffering. So human connection is to me, like the ultimate powerful healing gift that God has given us. So, or whoever, you know, if it's not God, the person upstairs or, uh, who was it that I was talking to that told me the to whom it may concern. (laughs) So I love that. When I heard that one, I was like, I've never heard someone call the big man upstairs to whom it may concern. (laughs) So, yeah. So I just, you know, it, it all depends. I feel like family chemotherapy's goal is really to meet people with where they're at. And that's a goal with any therapist is just to meet you where you're at. We're not trying to tell you, you need to go to therapy if you're not ready for it. If the most that you can do is read a book on your own or make a new friend, you know, then that in itself can have a lot of healing power. So the goal is to meet you where you're at and provide therapists across all 50 states. Um, And a story behind that, and this is why I actually wanted to do the database. I have a friend who her child was diagnosed I came to find out actually recently that it was my, one of my good friends. Um, but Mm -hmm. in our community, another therapist told me the story. And so I was like, Oh, you're the person that they were talking about. My friend tells me that she went to go look for a therapist. She said she went to about five different providers. She called up five different, you know, counselors and told them, this is my story. I'm looking for a therapist. And she was like, when she, she said that when she called her ther- those these therapists, that she wasn't like distraught. She was so nonchalant when she was speaking about it. Like, here's my, my situation. Are you taking new patients? Or are you willing to take me on? And they were like, I'm so sorry. Like, this is just too close for me. I, I can't work with you. And wow. so she got turned down like five different times. And I'm like, that shouldn't have to happen you know? And although my therapist was helpful in some ways, I still feel like there was a lack of understanding because locally there are no therapists who work, who are parents who have children who survive from cancer. So I did go to some random therapist. 
Um, especially since my friends are all therapists. So I can't be like, can I come to you for therapy? Like I, it's like an ethical issue, right? So like dual relationship. So I had to go to some random stranger and unfortunately it wasn't like super great, but at least I had a place to go and be vulnerable and talk about things when I needed to. Um, but there was still a lack of like understanding and ways to hold me accountable and help me, um, keep certain things in focus. And so, um, I feel like that is the goal ultimately to just, I don't want to have other families feel like I, you know, like my friend did who didn't know where to go for therapy. And when she goes, he or she goes to a therapist that they just, they're not equipped. And so the goal is to have a database and provide educational, um, continuing education is what we call it in the professional world, but basically provide continuing education for the professional so that they can be, um, knowledgeable. I, I would like to call it, you know, instead of trauma informed, cause everyone talks about, I need to go to a trauma informed therapist. We need to have a cancer informed therapist, like someone who is that. familiar yes. with the cancer world. So my goal is to yes. create cancer informed therapists who are willing to work with childhood cancer families, not just the child, but the parents and the siblings. That's perfect. You know, I, I'm certified in trauma informed care and nowhere in their certification do they talk about trauma in this type of atmosphere. It's, it's veterans, um, God bless them. They do so much for the country, but that's what it focuses on and domestic violence most of the time, but it never focuses on traumas like health traumas. Mm -hmm. I never said the training didn't consist of that and maybe it should have, or maybe there was something wrong with the training, but I feel like having had the trauma and understanding it, yeah, definitely. And you as well, it would probably be, well, it would be unethical for me to go to you, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but going to someone with that background would be, would be nice. And to have a, a database to work with would just be fantastic. So, yeah, it's a, it's a big task. So I guess if you are listening and you have a therapist who you highly recommend, or you are a therapist who works with this population and you have not signed up for the database, please do go to the website. And um, I will have a link on there. I'm kind of slow moving to uh, get that link up on there, but you can always send me an email and I've got a link for you to actually fill out all the um, information, but it's just important to have people in every state because, or available to do therapy in different states, because most states have that limitation where you can only practice within your state that you're licensed in. Now, I don't know about the, the East coast because you guys are like little tiny states. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Texas is a really a big state. So they're like, you got to be licensed in Texas. You cannot do therapy outside of the state of Texas, unless you have a license across, you know, cross state lines. So yes, that's the important part is making sure that we have coverage for all the states. Yes. And it's going to be, it'll like you said, it'll be hard to do, but once you do it, oh my God, this is, this is going to be great. It's going to be fantastic. And I'm so excited for it to come out. Yeah. Happy <laughs> yeah. dance. Happy, happy dance, dance over happy. here. Yes. Yes. All those tuning in, you can do your happy dance unless you're driving. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best time to dance though. Cause then, you know, people are watching yeah. you or not watching you and you can just yeah, I know, dance right? in your car. <laughs> <laughs> car dancing. Yes. Um, so you have an Instagram account that we can go to other than just your website. And what is that? Yeah. So my Instagram account, uh, is family underscore chemotherapy. And okay. I'm also on Facebook and yeah, uh, technically I'm on Twitter, but I'm like the worst on Twitter. Like, so you can find me, but 
I'm not really active on, on Twitter. Yeah. And if you guys have any trouble finding her, don't worry. It's always in my show notes. If you go to www.livingwithscanxiety.org backslash show notes, which is always linked in the uh, description of the podcast episode, you can click that and it'll take you right to the show notes for Adriana when her episode is published, which will be when you're listening to this. (laughs) 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 And um, at which time all the links will be under her uh, description of her, her podcast. So I'm super excited that you were able to come and I always finish on a light note, although I feel like this episode was super positive. Um, so I just have a couple of questions for you. Are you willing to play with me? Yeah, let's do it. If you could read minds or tell the future, what would you do? Um, I would be really dangerous. I would be like a, <laughs> I'd be the psycho psychotherapist. because <laughs> <laughs> I would legit be able to like, know what people are thinking. And, you know, if I tell them, well, you should try this treatment modality and hear their resistance to like any of my, my treatment. Yeah. I would be a psycho psychotherapist in okay. all the funny ways. And like, I heard what you just said, <laughs> <laughs> really, you really feel that way. And they're, it would trip them out. Like they'd be like, oh my gosh, that person knows what I'm thinking. That's if I can read minds, if I could tell the future. Yeah, I I, I don't. You, can, you should not be with paranoia. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. God. I don't even know if this is a professional uh, conversation at this point. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and then my next question I'm going to change up. And that is. Try not to put it in a run on one sentence. What is your life's mission? I feel like my life's mission is to, to use my God given gifts to help other people find their inner strength to overcome whatever adversity they've faced so that they can believe in themselves and find their inner resilience to live a life more meaningful and filled with purpose and joy. That should be my drop. Yeah, <laughs> drop. yeah. That was that needs to be on like a poster. <laughs> Someone <laughs> daily daily <laughs> affirmation. Yeah. <laughs> she just did her um photo pose. <laughs> yeah. You see on family chemotherapy. But um <laughs> That's awesome. I I want that in a poster. Thank you so much. This has been such a fun interview. And I hope everybody check out that stuff and get on my website, www.livingwithscanxiety.org backslash show notes. Find Adriana out and you will um, see all the links once you click on her photo. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me, Rosario. This was really fun. And I hope to connect with you, your audience, and be a service for years and years to come.